I've got to go pick it up. So we're going to look at slugs and snails. So this is an extension bulletin that I've uh, copied for you. Uh, University of California, where they have a, notices under their integrated pest management program. So they, they have a, all the universities have a, a lot of these different things. And I bring this up just because slugs are a big problem in a lot of different areas. I haven't seen, obviously, with our climate here, do we have a lot of slugs? We have some, but not, not like what you have on the west side at all, where it's anything on the west coast, you know, all up and down through California, western Oregon, western Washington. Um, they're really important pests. And we have both slugs and snails. Okay, so if we look at this, we've got some pictures here that you can see better. Let me, uh, I can at least turn out one of these lights. Is that better? Is that the best? Okay. So you can just put, I just figure you could make little lines next to your stuff as I talk about it. Um, so basically snails and slugs are both members of the mollusk family, as we can see here. And they're very similar in their structure. The only thing difference between slugs and snails is that snails have a spiral shell on them where slugs don't. Okay. They both have uh, that muscular foot at the bottom here that they travel on. Okay, And that's what makes us not like them so much because that muscle, in order for them to travel, secretes a constant mucus. Okay, So it slides over everything. And that's, um, that, silvery, that silvery slime snail that you have seen I know I can remember in Western Washington going into a cabin that had been deserted for a while, and all you saw were the slime trails all over the windows, and I just went, ah, icky. Okay. Actually, yes, and and basic basically that uh, how they they can hibernate in there in the shell. Okay, so when they when it get dries out for a snail, they have like a little mucous membrane that they can shut and they can hibernate in their shell, whereas the slugs have to go into the soil. Okay, and stuff like that. Um, if you notice here, I'll go down just a little bit for the the lifetime. Which yeah, go ahead. I don't know that answer. I don't know. I would think not because I thought they were attached to them, but I will, but I will have to d I'll double check. My first answer, my guess would be no, but I am not sure, so I will look that up. Because I don't think they're, I don't think they can, but I will double check. Okay, as far as reproduction, both slugs and snails are hermaphroditic or hermaphrodites, so they can both lay eggs, both the males and females, so they don't need each other. Um, the snails lay a lot more eggs at a time. They lay about 80 at a time, and slugs, it says anywhere between 3 to 40 beneath leaves. And I think what I found most interesting um, is that the um, snails can lay their eggs up to six times a year, and they don't mature for about two years. So it's a two-year life cycle for them, whereas slugs reach maturity in three, three to six months. And I just thought that was pretty, pretty amazing that that uh, I didn't know snails got to be two years old. Okay, and they're most likely to be in places dark, damp places. So if you have areas where you're letting leaves lay around as mulch or boards or rocks or things like that, that's where you're going to find these. Okay, so the more uh, piles of things and things you have hidden right near your plants. Um, these snails and slugs could live there. And notice it says during cold weather, snails and slugs hibernate in the topsoil. Um, snails can seal themselves off with that parchment-like thing that goes over here. And you'll see snails attach themselves to tree trunks, fences, or walls too. So they can just hang right there. The main damage that you're going to see from snails and slugs uh, some of them are just going to feed on decaying matter, but we have some that actually you'll see the see the chewing holes that you've got here with the slugs. Boy, they love uh, 
Oh, I'm just trying to think. Why can't I even think of what they are? All kinds of the winter winter foliage on the west side of the flowers that you plant. Um, they love that. But notice they can um, also chew fruit and young plant bark, so something that um, they can get their their little chewing mouths into. They like the succulent foliage and flowers the best, and they're going to go for the seedling plants and herbaceous species. Okay, they're not going to go after the woodies as much. And obviously, there are serious pests that are close to the ground. So anything like strawberries, artichokes, tomatoes can be fairly low to the ground. Can you think of anything else? Anybody had trouble with slugs on their plants at all? Strawberries, yeah. I thought it was interesting that they will feed on citrus, because I don't think as citrus trees as being very short, you know what I mean? So they actually, they actually will crawl up citrus trees. So you got to think, that, okay, it's warm and moist um, for a lot of the year. Okay, the main thing what you have to look at is when you see these chewing hole damages like this, look for the mucus trails because you could have damage from earwigs, caterpillars, or other chewing insects. So just make sure to, to totally look at it before you try to do something for it. And a lot of the slugs are um, imported, like the big banana slug that was brought in on plants from South America and stuff like that. So on the west side, we have a lot more varieties of them, but there are native slugs to the, to the forests and the things on the west side as well. You probably never thought you'd be going over a good slug and snail management program. Um, but the first thing, just like with any pesticide management program, is to eliminate places where they can hide, get rid of the, the boards, the stones, the debris, weedy areas around tree trunks, leafy branches uh, close to the ground so they can hide under there. They like to hide in dense ground covers like ivy. And where you can't get rid of what's ever there, just try to uh, minimize what you've got out there so you've got separate places. So there's going to be a place probably left where you're going to have to go look. Okay, if you can't get rid of it, you've got a low edge like they talk about here on a fence, then you're going to go look under there and get rid of all the other spots where they could hide. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. One of the things you can do in your management system is one of the things that you guys have already done in viticulture with minimizing diseases is switch to a drip irrigation instead of an overhead irrigation so that it limits the amount of water that's out. And if you think about what our soils are like around here in a lot of places, you can have some gravelly, sandy soils, and they do not like gravelly, sandy soils at all. Okay, it, they're, if that mucus will help go over some of it, but they just don't like it. Um, the one thing that we can do, and you notice right here in the middle paragraph, I need to put my coffee down here, is we can use copper barriers, okay, for protecting susceptible plants. And you can see it doesn't show up as well, but here's a tree with a copper band around it, and they actually have gone ahead. It's a very thin copper uh, piece of metal, and they've actually, you know, tacked it to the tree, and then they've actually cut some little strips into it so it folds up um, around the tree. And then the snails, I'll put it down here. You can probably see better on here. These are, see all the snails that are here? They can't get past that coppery band. It, it, it actually gives them a shock, okay? And, and uh, they, won't go, they won't go over it. Um, copper? I don't think, I don't know about copper and cutworms. I don't know that. I don't know. I've never heard that before with any of the cutworms that I've dealt with, but they got the, um, I just know in turf grass where we've got the, the uh, black cutworms, the height of the grass, by leaving grass higher, they can actually have a place to live. You know, so it depends on the environment around it, but I don't know, but I'll check on the, now I got two things to check on, right? Snails in their shells and copper and cutworms. So I'll, I'll look, at, look that up and get back to you. Um, what's interesting is you can also look at the plants that you're going. So some of the plants that uh, slugs and snails are going to go after as far as herbaceous plants, they love basil, they love beans, cabbage, dahlias, delphiniums, 
pastas. That's probably the worst one I've seen damaged. Lettuce, marigolds. Remember how people tell you to plant marigolds in your garden to keep insects away? Well, it doesn't work on slugs. Okay, strawberries and a lot of the other vegetables. Okay, so the ones that resist snails and slug damage, which, you know, I find very surprising when I think about it, is begonias, because I thought begonias, the shade-loving plants that they are, I thought that the slugs would take them out, but they don't. The California poppy, fuchsias, geraniums, impatiens, lantanas, nasturtiums, purple robe, cup flower, which I'm not very familiar with, and uh, anything with stiff leaves, they don't like that. They're all about feel and their feel and their foot. How does that sound? And um, the highly scented foliage, anything like lavender, rosemary, and sage. Okay, and if it's a woody plant or an ornamental grass, which is going to be more stiff, they don't really bother that very much. Um, and like I said, probably here in Walla Walla, you're not going to have a lot of damage from slugs unless you're watering all the time, uh, which you could. Hand picking is what home gardeners normally do. Um, I don't find that very uh, appropriate on a, a large level. Um, they tell you you can get your rubber gloves out and pick them off. Um, they tell you you can put them in a bucket of water or spray a 5 to 10 percent solution of ammonia on them. Um, I know some people who've gone out there and just sprinkle salt on the slugs. You know, basically it just breaks their, you know, dries them out. It's kind of cruel because it's a slow death. Um, there are people, oh, what's this? I'm trying to think of the lady's name on the west side, that she's a, a, I don't know if you call her a slug lover or whatever, but she doesn't like, you know, don't put salt on them, it hurts them. So she collects them and puts them in baggies and freezes them and then throws, throws them out in the garbage. Don't you think freezing is just about as bad as putting salt on you? I don't know. I'm not a slug, so I don't know. Although I, anyway, we'll go ahead and get off of that. So there's, there's a lot of different ways. Now, one of the ways that you can do it are constructing traps. Okay, so basically they said inverted melon rinds make good traps in the garden. So you can trap them underneath them, you know, put them under boards and then a pest will crawl underneath and then you can scrape them off the inside of it. I like this. Don't use salt to destroy snails and slugs because it will increase soil salinity. How much salt are you going to put on? I mean, come on. I, I, I just have to laugh at that. That's like a West Side Bulletin. Anyway, we won't. You've heard of beer being used for slug control? So basically, you just got to have make sure that the, they're going to crawl in the container and they're going to drown is what's going to happen. So the sugar and the yeast actually attracts them. Uh, so I say keep the beer for yourself. Put sugar and yeast water out there. You can sit and watch the slugs drink the beer, okay, and then watch the slugs fall into the sugary yeast water. Okay, the main thing is, is just so the, 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 slot, the sides are steep enough so that the slugs or snails can't crawl out. Okay, so, so basically you're drowning them. What a good way to go, huh? Drowning beer. Okay, they say it's not very effective because it's labor involved. Well, if it's your home yard, that would be okay. Okay, because you can, you can go ahead and put something out. You can also use uh, bait. Where's the, oh, that's on the next slide. And this is just going back over the copper, they call it a copper foil when they get it that um, narrow. So they sell that already. And there are some copper screens you can use too. Metal is fairly expensive. Um, so you need at least something that you can keep at least four inches tall if you're gonna put it around the barrier of a garden thing or something so they can't crawl up. Oh, what else does they do here? I like this as well. Here's our Bordeaux mixture in here as well for controlling slugs and snails. So we've got something else. I thought so, because the copper sulfate, so you can either use the Bordeaux or just the copper sulfate alone brushed onto the trunk. And they said one application per year will keep the snails from going up the trunk, which I thought that was pretty, I had never heard that. So it says it'll last about a year. And if you use a commercial spreader or sticker, they said it, it could last for uh, as much as two years. Um, abrasive layers, and I can't imagine, of course, the only place where I've had experience with slugs has been on the western side of Washington, and it says a barrier of dry ashes, there just wouldn't be dry ashes um, that they would crawl over. Um, so basically, that's not going to be a good, a good control measure. 
Um, there are natural enemies. So one of them is this devil's coach horse. So that's a beetle. And it's a little over an inch long. And it feeds on snails and slugs. So it will actually um, de decrease the populations. Um, and they have a predatory snail here. It's called the decolate snail. And it actually feeds on other snails. And it says that they've actually released it in the citrus orchards to control the brown snails, like what they had on this that previous couple pages where the where that copper foil layer was. That was the brown garden snails. Um, so it only feeds on the smaller snails. So if you've got full-grown snails, it doesn't really help a whole lot. Um, but there's a problem. Um, this, the decolate snails can also feed on seedlings and small plants, so you have to watch where you're, where you're putting them out. Um, trying to think of what else we got here. Baits, you just have to be real careful when you put it out. Um, the metaldehyde is the most common bait, but they're, par they're poisonous to dogs and cats especially, and they'll go after those pellets. So if you're going to put something out like a bait, make sure it's something that no cat or dog could get to. Um, and you don't want it on anything. Don't put it on anything that could be eaten later on. Um, they do have some of the baits that have a little bit of carburyl or what we would call seven, okay, to increase the efficacy. Um, and again, that will that will break down over over time. I know it says, however, carburyl is toxic to earthworms. There aren't very many. Uh, insecticides or fungicides that aren't uh, toxic to earthworms. Um, and basically, somebody's car backfire? It sounded kind of weird. It sounded like what? Oh, okay. So anytime I apply, um, especially an insecticide, I'm probably going to uh, reduce the beneficial population for a couple weeks, but they will build back up again. Okay, so I'm not as worried about that as, as uh, they are with that, but definitely it's going to affect them. Um, the other thing, you notice what happens um, when, we, uh, when you use the bait that has metaldehyde on it. Um, they dry, they, pff, I'll get it out. When there's a hotter or drier period, they're going to they're gonna die from desiccation or dehydration quicker. Um, notice it says that within, uh, they usually die within one day of ingesting or getting it on their foot because that brings it into their body. Um, so basically, if it's cool and wet, it's going to take a higher dose to, to kill them. Um, and it just tells you you don't have to water three or four days after bait placement so you can try to get them um, to under control. The most safe bait is an iron phosphate bait, and you probably see them, I love the names on these things, as sluggo or escargo. Isn't that cool? Um, and the main reason the iron phosphate is safe around your domestic animals, fish, children. So you'll see that, they're, you, that the iron phosphate baits um, are going to be pushed uh, for integrated pest management more. And basically, the iron phosphate just stops them from feeding Okay, so as you stop from feeding, then it's going to take longer to die, right? It's just going to be a... So it, you may not consider that very humane uh, to keep them from dying, but they're not going to stay out anywhere. They're going to go hide, and so you won't see snail shells all over the place. Okay. Um, let me think what else. It just tells you how to put the baits out, put them around sprinkler heads, places... Places where they're going to be wet, don't pile your bait in mounds or clumps uh, because it can be more attractive to other animals that you don't want to control or to kill. Okay? So is that more than you ever wanted to know about slugs and snails? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording here. <laughs>